So one of the most culturally significant and visually impressive objects collected on Cook's voyages is what's known as a mourner's costume um, from the islands of Tahiti. The mourner's costume, it's something that's very important in Tahiti because that's a unique costume that is used for the ceremonies when the chiefs die. And there are very few conserved in the world. So this project is, is very, very exciting. And the way we are working all together on this project is very exciting too. The Monarch costume was worn uh, during the ceremonies for the death of a chief, uh, R.E., or for the very important people of the society. So maybe it was a priest, maybe it was someone from the family of the dead person that was wearing this costume and that performed a kind of ceremony with other young people that were accompanying him. So Joseph Banks, the botanist on Cook's first voyage, wrote in his journal how he and several members of the crew witnessed this um, incredible ceremony that was taking place to mark the death of a Tahitian chief. Banks writes in his journal this description, this very vivid scene of how he witnessed the chief mourner emerging from the shadows at dawn and dusk wearing this incredible costume. Banks witnesses this ceremony and Cook and he are really keen to try and acquire one of these Tahitian mourners costumes but the Tahitians are not willing to part with it. Um, for them, it, it's, it's made up of this kind of layers and layers of valuable materials, and it would have taken so much time and effort to create these fine layers of bark cloth, the feathered cloak, the feathered headdress, the pearl shell chest piece, which is made of thousands of tiny pieces of cut pearl shell. The endeavour that has gone into making this costume, there's nothing that Cook's crew have with them that is worth them trading this object for. But when Cook returned on his second voyage, he had realised that there was something that Tahitians were interested in trading, and that was red feathers. Um, in Tahiti and across Polynesia, the colour red is very important. So Cook, being a cunning uh, and intelligent chap, when he went back on the second voyage, he had collected red feathers in another one of the Pacific Islands, and he took them to Tahiti, and one of the things he was then able to do was, was to trade those red feathers, and Tahitians um, agreed at that point to part with a number of Tahitian mourners' costumes, and one of those costumes is the one that subsequently came to the British Museum. We were lucky enough to be able to dedicate about six months of time to the conservation work on the costume. And what's been exciting from uh, my perspective as a curator is that the opportunity that that six month period has provided to bring a whole range of people into the museum, basically to stand around and talk about this amazing artifact. So it's the collaborative nature of the conservation work that for me has been the most exciting part. As you can see, we have quite a lot of pieces that make up the costume and we've got them laid out now because what we're doing is having a look at them and checking if they're stable enough for display and thinking about what kind of conservation work and what kind of mounting they might need to enable us to have them on display. Conservation wise, lots of different materials, lots of things to think about when we're thinking about mounting. All these things together make it quite a heavy object and we want that to hang and look really, really special when it's on display. Some of these smaller pearl shell elements are coming loose, so we're going to look at stabilising them. We also have the feathers to think of as well. So like with lots of other pieces of the costume, some of the feathers have been damaged in the past by overhandling, by pests, um, and we need to make sure that they're stable so that we don't lose any of these fantastic feathers um, as part of the display. Many of the costume elements of the Tahitian mourner's costume are made out of material called bark cloth. And bark cloth is made from the inner fibre of many different varieties of tree bark. And when it's beaten together, the fibres start to mesh into a fabric that can essentially be thought of as a non-woven textile. Here we have two bark cloth taputas. 
And what is absolutely fantastic is that when we started this project and we're looking at the mourner's costume, we only knew about one of the taputas. Uh, as we were actually taking parts of the costume off of the easel, we found a bundle that was attached to the easel. We got that bundle out and we unwrapped it and inside of it we found this second taputa. So what we thought was originally really amazing and, and is absolutely fantastic is that this larger taputa here, you can see the faint stripes of colour that would have gone along the arms and down the front. And this was all kind of put really in perspective when we opened up the bundle and found this taputa that hadn't been seen for hundreds of years and had been protected against light. So you can see really the vibrant red colour there. So especially with this second taputa, because it has been folded up in this bundle, you can see that there are a lot of creases there. And from a conservation point of view, creases are places where materials become weak. Uh, so we want to try and remove those creases as much as possible. For us, it's very interesting uh, to know about the exact materials, the dyes, the vegetal elements that were used to make this costume. One of the most important materials that is part of the costume are birds' feathers. We invited colleagues from the Natural History Museum to come and examine the feathers because we wanted to try and make sure that we knew what, exactly what species were being used. Today I'm here because the British Museum asked me to look at lots of feather material that is used in uh, artefacts coming from Tahiti. The species we found in here, some are rather interesting, others are very well expected. Um, but overall, when you look at the, um, the feathers, the feather cloaks, and the headdresses, many black feathers but from different species. Um, Black chickens are used, uh, frigate birds, um, but also lots of imperial pigeon. One of the objects we found, a hairdress, had clearly pigeon feathers in them, but a few of those feathers really um, yeah, catch my eye because I thought I recognised something special about them. And by close observation, I think I recognised them as being an extinct species. Um, a species we never knew where it came from. Uh, Tahiti was suggested as the place of origin, but we do not know. Um, this species, the spotted green pigeon, uh, and as the name already suggests, it's a greenish pigeon with spots, and the spots are white. This species probably became extinct before 1800. So by finding those feathers, and if we can confirm the feathers are indeed from this species, then at least we know the origin. And by knowing the origin, we can learn more and more about a species who has already gone for now, over 200 years. For the DNA analyzing, we will take a very small sample of one of the feathers, um, which we think is from spotted green pigeon, from this very tiny sample. Experts can uh, extract DNA, and from the DNA we can tell um, whether it is the species we think it is. And the only reason we can tell um, is because there is a specimen left. One specimen in Liverpool and DNA is already taken from that specimen. So if we compare it and we find a match, then we know for sure that the feathers found here in this hairdress belong indeed to spotted green pigeon. The more striking when you see these kind of costumes now is the grey, white pearl shells and the black feathers of the cloak and so we think a lot of all these black and white things. In the, the modern costume of, of the British Museum we can see all these colourful tapa and so we are really waiting to know what uh, colours were the original ones, what plants were used to make them just to be sure that what we know now in Tahiti, the different uh, colours we use, uh, how we make the dyes today, is it similar to what was made at the end of the 18th century? In images of the costume from the time of collection, a lot of it is really, really colourful. Although this looks slightly brown and slightly faded, you can actually see tantalising hints of colour here. Maybe some yellow, maybe some red here. So it's great that we have the scientists at the museum on board who are going to be analysing some of the pigments and give us more information about what the true colours of the costume are likely to have been. There were three main colours, which were red, black and yellow. The red and the black were very easy to spot in many of the, of the costume parts, 
The yellow was a little more tricky. It underwent a lot of fading. So actually we were able to clearly see the yellow on, only when we unfolded some of the, of the parts of the costume. And so where it was protected from the light, we saw this yellow appearance, which was expected because there are drawings showing the costume being bright red and yellow decorated. There were areas, again, when it was clear that a yellow color was there, areas that where it was less clear but kind of expected. The first thing that we did, we used a UV light source. So the, the UV light would have the possibility to excite the yellow dyes, which would emit these possibly characteristic luminescence. And this was the case as soon as we, as we switched the UV light on, a bright yellow-green fluorescent appeared. And so the fact that this yellow underwent a lot of fading and the fact that it showed this typical yellow-green luminescence pointed towards one candidate being highly likely, and this is turmeric, another quite common source of yellow in this, in this part of the world. And we took a sample at that point, and this is what the sample looked like under the microscope. Another indication of turmeric could be obtained because these yellow particles on the fibers are very consistent with what turmeric looks like under the microscope. It's a direct dye, which means that it sticks directly on the fibers without the need of a mordant. And, and this is what, what it usually looks like. But ultimately, it was the presence of the turmeric was confirmed by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Today there are kind of complete costumes in London, in Oxford, in Göttingen in Germany, in Hawaii and in Exeter. But there aren't that many that are as complete as the amazing dramatic costume that we have here at the British Museum. And um, it's, it's got so many different elements to it um, that add to this bulk, this height, this splendour that the redisplay of it here in the exhibition I think will really be an impressive spectacle for visitors.